is the last of the current series of talks on human awareness and the subject is love, total awareness and oneness. I don't know why the subject is framed like that and titled like that and why it was necessary to use three expressions where one could have done because there is no difference between love, total awareness and oneness. They are just the same thing. The experience of love generates the experience of total awareness. And total awareness means oneness. All exercises in development of awareness lead to the experience of total awareness. Total awareness is the highest experience that we can visualize or know in terms of growth of human awareness. We have had problems in developing human awareness because we have had problems in understanding our own selves. Whenever we have been able to understand our own selves, we have automatically, without further effort, without any other mechanics, been able to develop higher awareness. Self-realization is the same thing as developing total awareness. Also, what is total awareness? It is the same thing as total consciousness. The emphasis is on totality, entirety, wholeness, oneness. When that experience of totality is realized, then we say that it is an experience of total consciousness. And total consciousness is the more definitive word for the commonly used word God. There is no difference between God and total consciousness. God, the creator, the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient power cannot be conceived, understood, defined in any other way except as total consciousness. Why? Because we who are doing so were conceiving, perceiving, experiencing, looking forward to perceiving, experiencing him, are conscious. If we were not conscious, God could be quite different. Being conscious ourselves, God, who is our own creator and totality, cannot be anything but conscious. It is not possible that we, the created ones, are conscious and the creator does not have that uh, attribute of consciousness. The creator must be more than we are. Otherwise, how could he create us? And how could he then be present in all of us if he is not consciousness and we are conscious? In terms of human awareness, there is only one thing of which we are aware and we are absolutely certain of it. And that is that we are conscious. There is nothing else of which we are so certain. Everything else can be dreamlike, hallucination, illusion, a play, something that is just played upon us. We are not certain of anything else, but we are quite certain that we are conscious. This is one part of human experience, human awareness, of which we have no doubt. About every other part, we have doubt. Then this is the one part which could not be missing from any kind of God, any kind of creator, any kind of totality, any kind of infinite power that creates and sustains us. Therefore, God must be conscious, and if he is in all of us, he must be total. Therefore, it is right to say he is total consciousness. If he is total consciousness, then the path towards total awareness is in fact not the selfish path to discovery of the self, but turns to be a path towards God-realization. Self-realization in its larger terms means God-realization. Total self is God and distinguished from the self which is individuated God. Individuated God under a cover. If we are total self, why should we go around looking for ourselves or God? Do we have to go somewhere? Nobody goes to look for himself. We always go out to look for someone else. This is one strange scene where we are running around to look for ourselves. In India, we have a deer, that animal called deer, called the musk deer. It has a strange packet of perfume inside it and it smells beautiful. The deer carries the perfume inside its skin but
but thinks that the smell, the perfume is coming from outside and runs all around the forest looking for that perfume. That's what we are doing. We are looking for ourselves outside. We run all over to find where we are. Why don't we stay where we are? We make so many trips under religion, under opium, under drugs, under yoga, under meditation, under studies, scholarship. We make so many trips out to reach for ourselves. When the simple thing to do to find ourselves is to cancel all the trips. If we stopped making mental trips, we would know what we are. Have we ever realized that the only thing that prevents us from knowing or being what we are, are our mental trips? The trips along the thought stream, sometimes here, sometimes there, we are traveling on thoughts all the time. And we are not what we are. At least we don't know. We are not aware of what we are. We, have, we can't change. We are what we are. We lose awareness of what we are. And just by cancelling these trips and being ourselves, we discover the experience, the awareness of our own selves. But it is far more beautiful to look for ourselves outside than inside. There is a story of a lady in an Indian village who was looking for something she had lost. She was looking under the street light because in Indian villages, all villages don't have electricity. They don't have light. And people go to sleep at sundown, at sunset, and wake up at sunrise and use the sunlight for their daily work. When the sun sets, they go to sleep. Very simple life they lead. It is a story of that village. And that old lady was therefore looking under the street light, which keeps lighted up to prevent burglaries and robberies. And a man, young man passing by, saw this lady was in distress looking for something. Said, ma'am, can I help you? And she said, sure. He said, ma'am, what have you lost? She said, I have lost my sewing needle and I'm looking for that. And the man said, oh, I'll try and help look for you. Where did you drop it? She said, I dropped it in my house over there. And he said, ma'am, but why are you looking over here? And she said, it's very dark in there. <laughs> <laughs> this story makes you laugh, makes me laugh. But this is precisely what we are all doing. We are looking for ourselves outside of ourselves because if we close our eyes and be ourselves, it's too dark in there. It's a fact it's dark in there. And therefore we don't look in there. We want to look where the light is. We want to see where the books are lit up, where the halls are there, lectures, speeches, things which are happening. We look for ourselves in the happenings, not in the experiences of the happenings. Whereas we are the experiences of the happenings. The happenings are around us. And we are going out into the happenings to see us. And if we get frustrated, then we become artists. What does an artist do? All art in the world is an attempt to look at yourself outside yourself. The artist merely tries to find himself on canvas, on the stage, in the instrument, because he can't look inside. In the work of art, he wants to see himself. It is not the happiness of the artist which produces real work of art. It is the frustration of the artist at not being aware of himself, which forces him to produce that in which he can at least see part of himself. We are all great artists that way. Because we are all trying to see ourselves outside. Some come to this formal art. Some merely enjoy their image seen through many mirrors. Mirrors, physical mirrors to start with. We don't even look at our physical body. Very few do. Most of us look at ourselves in an image, in a mirror. That's us. And more of us don't even care for what the mirror says. We like to see the mirror of public opinion. What others say. That is what we are. We just forget what we are. We want to know what others think we are. And that is what we are. Continuously, our experience creates outwardness, distance, trips, further away from the self. And the art of just being yourself is just to be yourself. Why should it be difficult? The most obvious thing is made complicated by the use of this beautiful machine we carry. It's a beautiful machine we carry which is called mind, intellect, the thinking machine. This machine keeps on sending us out, keeps on making us 
unaware of ourselves, keeps on creating illusions, keeps on tying us down into that which is not the self. There are many covers upon the self, but we are aware of that. Cover shouldn't bother us. We know that the speaking self is not this body, because if there was no life consciousness, this body wouldn't do a thing. As the conscious self, we are using the body. And the body is using a jacket. If I wear a jacket, I carry the jacket with me all the time, I don't say I am the jacket. I am not the jacket. I am using the jacket. Then in what way is my physical body different? I am using the physical body. I am wearing it as a conscious being. As a conscious being, I am making the same use of the physical body as I make of the jacket. If the jacket gets dirty, old, torn, I take it off, put on another. When this physical body can't stand the rigors of experience too much, I throw it off, die, and take on another. Consciousness persists. It is persisting all the time. If it didn't persist, we wouldn't be here. Consciousness has never lost itself. It's been consistent, has always been there. If consciousness disappeared, where would the world be? Because the whole world has come up because of consciousness. If there was nobody conscious of the world, what world will be there? And what world do we know except of which we are conscious. Can we imagine a non-conscious, unconscious material world floating up in space of which nobody is conscious? If that ever happens, there will be no world. The world subsists on the awareness of it. And only that much subsists of which we are aware. There may be a world right here next to me in a form of energy of which I am not aware. There may be people standing here listening to me in forms we have not seen or experienced or are aware of. So that is not a world, because we are not aware of it. The world, the created world is only that much of which we are aware. If awareness is lost, if consciousness is lost, the whole world is lost. Because there is nothing else to create the world, to sustain the world, to have a world. And if there was a world independent from our consciousness of it, that might have lasted longer than us. But when there is no such world, then it cannot last beyond consciousness. So consciousness has existed along with the experience of the world all the time. If it changes its jacket, its physical bodies, it doesn't mean that consciousness is in any way changing. Therefore, consciousness persists and changes bodies. If that were not so, we would never say, this is my body. We would say, this is me. But we know what is mine cannot be me. If it is my body, then it cannot be me. Why? Then I am the claimant who says it's my body. Whoever claims it's my body, that's me. The one who makes the claim, this is my body, he's the one who is the self who's claiming. And that's the self we want to discover. Who says this is my body? When we claim this is my body, who's claiming it? Our conscious self. There's no one else who can claim. If we are not conscious, we don't make the claim. It is only the conscious part of the self that makes the claim, this is my body. Not only body. It says, these are my eyes, my ears. These are my sensory perceptions. This is my sight, my hearing. This is my mind. This is my soul. This is my God. All these things are possessed by something. What is that thing? The conscious self. What is mine cannot be me. Therefore, the me is that which claims that these are mine. And all these claims about all what we think is the self is made by consciousness. There is no doubt in my mind that when we say my body, my senses, my mind, my soul, my God, we are none of these things. We are the conscious claimant of all these things. Consciousness that claims these are all his things. From that point of view, it should be pretty easy to just be aware of consciousness and forget about these things. Just take off the covers. Can we do that? Can we really rip open this body to first produce the senses, then rip open the senses to produce a mind, then cut and kill the mind in order to release the soul, and then let the soul fly to totality to become God, and then we say that's what we have found out? then the one who has found out is all finished. It is not necessary to do any of these things. 
because when I am I, my jacket on me does not change me. What changes me is my awareness of it. What cloaks me is not the physical cover, nor even the mental or spiritual cover. What cloaks me is the cover of lack of awareness. Let me give you an example. Let us assume that the moon shining in the sky is the self. And there is a little pond in which the reflection can fall. But we so situate the pool, the water pool, that the moon's reflection first falls on a mirror, on a glass mirror, which is fixed on a stand that can be rotated. We let the reflection of the moon fall upon the rot rotating mirror, and from there we let it fall into the pool. We then add some gravel and sand in the pool, which settles down at the bottom. When we look at the mirror, we see the same moon which is up in the sky. There is no difference. If we move the mirror, then the moon in the mirror moves. That does not mean the moon in the sky is moving. The reflection of the moon in the mirror moves because the mirror moves. Okay? Then let this reflection fall into the pool where we again see the reflection down. The moon is up. We can see the moon down below. If we move the mirror, the moon in the pool also moves. Actually, the moon is not moving, but an intermediate reflector is moving, the mirror. Then in the pool, we cause a little ripple in the water. When we cause a little ripple in the water, the image of the moon in the water gets split up into small pieces. And we see it all floating like little pieces and moving. The moon has not broken up into pieces, it's still there, as it was. The water, the second reflector, has caused these ripples, and the ripples have caused the image of the moon to be broken up. Then we take a little long rod and stir the water more, and all the dirt and gravel and sand at the bottom of the pool comes up, and we can't see the moon anymore. The moon is still there. What has happened? We were seeing the reflection of the moon. We had the capacity to see the moon. But in this process of reflection and so on, and disturbance of the water, we couldn't see it. If we allow the sand and the dirt to settle down, we can still see the moon again in ripples moving about. If we allow the storm to pass and the ripples to end and the water to become calm, we'll see the moon moving along with the mirror. If we stop the movement of the mirror, we'll see the moon exactly as it is up in the sky. That's our situation. The moon in the sky represents our human consciousness. Human consciousness is operating in experience. It is gathering experience through these reflectors. What are these reflectors? The first reflector is the mind, which causes change. Mind converts the capacity to have conscious experience into the capacity to have conscious experience in time, thereby introducing change, which is represented by the movement of the mirror. When we have experience of consciousness here, it changes beginning, middle, end, days, nights. This is only a divided experience. Consciousness has not been divided. The change and movement in consciousness, in experience, has come because we are experiencing consciousness through the mind. The mind is creating change and this movement. Then what happens? We can still see the experience, consciousness, ourselves, but in change. We don't stop there. We then project this experience into senses. Senses are the ripples on the surface of the water, in the pool. These ripples are the sensations, the sensory attractions we have, which keep on breaking up the conscious experience into different sensory perceptions. Each sense draws us out, and these create the ripples in experience. The changing moon, the changing consciousness then, in time, gets into functional divisions of senses and become ripples. Consciousness has not been broken up. The experience of consciousness has been broken up into separate sense perceptions. But that is not all. On top of that, we put on this dirt, this, this big body, containing its own sense perceptions, 
its own eyes, ears, nose and all that. Not merely the capacity to see, capacity to hear, but the eyes to see, the ears to hear and so on. When we wear these, these then lead us out into experience in grossness, completely cutting us off from our experience of consciousness. That is when the dirt moves up and we can't see the reflection at all. We can't see ourselves, we can't be ourselves, we don't know ourselves just because of these reflectors and the dirt stirring up. And how do we realize ourselves? We don't have to cut up anything. We don't have to take the things out of the pool or change the mirror. Nothing. We leave the apparatus as it is. We leave everything together. The physical body, the senses, the mind, the soul, everything is together. But we reverse this process which has clouded our knowledge or awareness of ourselves. First, we withdraw this gross dirt and gravel coming up by putting the attention on the world outside. All the dirt and gravel we pick up from there and we stir it. We allow that to settle first. When the dirt and gravel of this earthly desires, earthly outward attractions is allowed to settle, we see our own consciousness. We see our own reality. And as we experience our own reality, we discover that our power to see, hear, touch, is not confined by the body. What have we achieved? We have merely allowed the dirt and gravel to settle in which the split moon, still shimmering on the top of the surface of the sensory perceptions is now visible. And we know, ah, that's how we could see. We didn't need eyes. We always assumed we needed these eyes to see. Till one day somebody says, look, don't you see in imagination? Don't you see in dreams? Don't you see in visions? Is that seeing something different? What makes you think that you have to open these eyes to see? How do you see then? Oh, well, we see with the mental eye, with imagination and so on. Whatever you call it, is seeing different from this seeing? We are not talking of the cause of seeing. We are talking of the capacity to see. Does consciousness possess the capacity to see, independent of these eyes or not? We are assuming it does not. Actually it does and we all experience it. What happens when we allow the dirt and gravel to settle is that we can experience the power to see without using these eyes to see. And we discover that this is our self which is seeing. This was only a cover, dirt which was holding it down. Was not letting us see ourselves. With these eyes we could only see the experience outside. With the eyes of imagination. We can see ourselves, at least more of ourselves. And yet that is broken up. That experience is broken up into seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, feeling. What is the need to break up experience? This is one beautiful life, one beautiful world. Why should we break up? We break up because of these subtle little ripples on the surface of the pool. The break up of experience into sense perception. When we withdraw our attention from sense perceptions to perception, when we allow the ripples to calm down on the surface of the water, we allow what is called mental perception to take place. We can perceive directly without having to break into sense perceptions. This capacity to perceive with the mind gives us a fresh knowledge of ourselves and opens up a knowledge of experience not broken up into pieces. We begin to see the moon shining in the pool without broken, broken pieces. No more breaking into hearing, seeing, touching separately. All in one piece, consciousness, perception, mentally perceiving directly. But still it moves because the mirror is still moving. The mirror makes the moon in the pool move. Then we hold the mirror down. What is that mirror? The mind. Mind is what causes change. When we hold our mind still, and do not allow it to change the experience of consciousness, we perceive consciousness exactly as it is up, the, up there. We have therefore a device of seeing ourselves, of being ourselves, while we are having all the covers and their functions within us, just by controlling them. Allow the dirt and gravel to settle. 
On top of this slam, then we put a cover. One of those Chinese covers, I don't know if you've seen them, which go with the heat of the light and go round and round. And the pattern which is made on that, sometimes a picture, Chinese house or something, that also goes round and round. And on the wall, you find the building going round and round. Actually, nothing is going round and round. The light is there. Only the cover upon the light is moving. On the wall, it looks like the light is moving around with that pattern. Then on that cover, on the chandelier we place upon the light, we put a second cover of lot of holes like we have these holes upon these lights. We have a number of holes put up, put up on that. That will go along with the inner cover and when that moves on the wall, we see a number of lights moving, all with their patterns. You have some psychedelic eating places having those lights moving. In India we have some now, we are modernizing. <laughs> Actually, the light is not moving. The light is still where it was, the same light. The cover upon the light is moving, nor are there so many lights, so many spots. The second cover creates the spots, divides the light into pieces. Then on top of that, we take a brown paper bag, the shopping bag in which we get our goods, the groceries, and we put it right on top of that light. And the whole thing becomes dull. It hardly throws any light on the wall. And itself, the light becomes dull and brown. Nothing has happened to the light. It is shining as bright as ever. Why it looks dull is because of the paper bag. This is our condition. The light of the soul, of consciousness, the illumination of consciousness, shines bright all the time. Never becomes less or more. Meditation or growth of awareness does not brighten the light within. Light is always bright. What happens is that upon this beautiful light of consciousness, we have put on a very funny kind of a moving pattern called mind, which creates all the motion and change and gives rise to the experience outside in space and the world as if all things are moving. Everything is in time, space, causation. Everything has a beginning, middle and end. Everything operates in time. Everything is an event. All experiences become events. Even timeless experiences become events through this process of the mental cover. And on top of that, we put a second cover, sensory perceptions, which break up that experience into senses. There are no spots, there's only one light, but looks like many lights because we have put the sensory cover. On top of that, we put this physical body, that brown paper bag, and we can't see our light anymore. Hardly any light falls on the world outside. This is our situation. How do we reverse it? Take off the covers one by one. As you take the brown paper off, you will see, oh, it's beautiful. There's a lot of light moving. As you take the second cover off, you find light is one, not split up. It has patterns moving, not light. As you take the third cover off, you find it's beautiful. Patterns are all made by covers. Light is one brilliant, beautiful white light which throws brightness all over the hall. This capacity to realize ourselves does not really involve taking off anything. It involves taking off the awareness of these things. Because what is restricting the light of consciousness is the awareness of the covers, not the physical presence of the covers. When we remove the awareness of the physical body, not the body, we see the light of the senses. When we remove the awareness of the senses, we see the light of the mind. When we remove the awareness of the mind, we see the light of the mind. Awareness of these covers is the cover. And how do we do it? By the art of shifting awareness from one thing to another through the process of concentration of attention. Human attention is the part of consciousness or awareness which we can manipulate. We can't change the awareness of the room around us, but we have the capacity to attend to this door or not. If we want to attend to the door, we put our attention upon the door. And if we don't want to attend to anything else in the room, we'll concentrate our attention upon the door. If we concentrate our attention fully, we will become aware of the door and become unaware of the rest of the room. But the room is there. The room doesn't have to be destroyed to pick up consciousness of the door. By this process, which is available to all of us, of the ability to concentrate attention upon one thing and becoming more aware of that and less aware of other things, 
we are able to achieve an awareness of our real self by becoming more aware of that and less aware of the color. If we concentrate sufficiently upon the door, we can be completely unaware of the room. If we concentrate sufficiently upon our self, of our conscious self, we can be completely unaware of the cover. In meditation, when we concentrate our attention upon our own self, conscious self, that is not the body, with a little practice, we become really unaware of the body. We pull our attention from the body, we become unaware of the body. The body is still there, it hasn't gone anywhere. We have in a controlled way withdrawn attention from the body and put it upon ourselves. And we experience sensory perceptions without the body. People call it astral projection. Various names are given, astral experiences. Astral experience is nothing but the capacity to have experience through sense perception while becoming unaware of the physical body. There's no other thing as astral world or astral uh, experience or something lying up in a heaven. Astral experience is nothing more than the capacity of consciousness to experience sensory perceptions while becoming unaware of the physical body. We can in turn also become unaware of the sensory perceptions and concentrate attention upon the mind, upon which we perceive directly through the mind and actually become unaware of the senses. It can be done. That is called meditation. The art of meditation is to progressively be more and more of your conscious self and not be covered upon that consciousness. When we become unaware of the mind and still retain consciousness of the self, we become that beautiful radiant light called the soul. This is then a simple way of going to your own self, being your own self, by withdrawing attention and awareness from the cover and retaining attention and awareness on the inner self, on the conscious self. What happens when we really attain this experience of our self beyond the mind? One of the most beautiful things that can happen in human awareness takes place, the experience of love. There is nothing greater that can happen in human consciousness in human awareness, in human experience, than the experience of love. What is love? Love is the capacity to identify with the beloved. Love is the experience of identification with the beloved. Love is the experience of oneness with the beloved. Love is the experience of togetherness with the beloved. Love is the experience of non-awareness of the lover and the only total awareness of the beloved. Love is the experience of unawareness of two and awareness of one. Love is the capacity to completely wipe out from awareness the I and completely substitute it in awareness with you. That is love. As we, many of us don't know, we deal with the gross form of it, which is attachment. Attachment is not love. Love is a spiritual experience. It is a non-mental experience. It's a supramental experience. It's an experience beyond the mind. It's not an experience of thinking. You can't think yourself into love, however hard you may try. You can think and think all your life, you'll never experience love. In fact, if you have the experience of love, you can think yourself out of it very easily. The mental experience of thinking is quite different from the spiritual experience of love. Attachment is a mental experience. In attachment, you are aware of two, the one who is attached and the one to whom one is attached. But we keep on using the word love. I love my dog, I love my house, I love my daughter, I love my son, I love you. There is more awareness of I than of you. The consciousness is held on both I and you. This is not love. This is attachment. This attachment creates awareness of both I and you. And awareness of both creates separation. Because they can't be two without separation. And separation causes pain. Attachment invariably causes separation. Separation causes pain. Attachment causes pain. What does love do? Love removes the two-ness and brings togetherness, oneness. In love, I is forgotten in favor of you. And the you so replaces the I that there is no two, only one. The you. And that you then is one with you. Therefore, there is no separation. 
there is no pain, there is only joy, happiness, beauty. Love automatically generates the experience of joy and happiness and beauty. Attachment creates the opposite experience, separation, pain, possessiveness, jealousy, ultimately hatred. Look at the difference qualitatively in the two experiences. When we commonly say, I love you, it means nothing. It means attachment. You are aware of I and you, otherwise you wouldn't say so. A person who says, I love you, I love you, is more aware of I. It's an ego trip he's making. As if it's a great thing he's doing, he's doing a favor to you by saying, I love you. What would a guy who's really in love say? He would say, you, 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 no time, no awareness of I. It never happens this way. This is a real, beautiful, spiritual experience. An experience one gets after transcending the mind which creates the separation. The mind analyzes, thinking process divides. By analysis, the soul, the consciousness of man synthesizes, brings together. Mind works in time, therefore must have parts, beginning, middle and end. The soul works beyond time, does not have any parts, cannot be separated with one. The experience of love has never taken time in anybody's experience. It is either there or it's not there. Thinking takes time. You can't think out even the smallest thought without taking time. But you can experience love. And you can never say how much time it took. Does it take two minutes to have the experience? One minute, one second? It is either there or not there. When it is there, it has taken no time. The other experiences that go with love or soul are the intuitive experience, which take no time. The experience of aesthetics or beauty, which take no time. The experience of joy, which takes no time. Either it is there or not. But these mental functions of thinking, reasoning, sensing, creating, they all take time. They all have parts. Therefore, it is a very great experience in human awareness to transcend the mental experience by a process of meditation that leads you to the spiritual experience of the soul of oneness in which you experience love. When you have experienced love with your own totality, you can't help but feel love with everything. Why? Because when you find the oneness of your own consciousness, you discover that essentially everyone is the same consciousness. Firstly, everyone is being created by the same consciousness. Wouldn't be there but for that consciousness, which you discover in the soul. Secondly, everyone is functioning in experience with the same consciousness. This beautiful experience of not looking at the difference between us, but the common consciousness between us, comes to the experience of the soul. The more we use our mind, the more we see the differences between us. Different clothes, different bodies, different faces, different languages, different nationalities, different religions. All the differences are noticed by the mind. The soul notices only one common thing. Common consciousness, common awareness. We have the same common awareness, same consciousness. We have no difference in our consciousness. The same conscious light operates in all of us. The awareness of this common consciousness comes through the realization of one soul. Therefore, when one talks of developing awareness to totality, one does not merely talk of an abstract symbol, some way out God which one is going to meet. One talks of development of one's own total awareness and discovery of that oneness amongst all conscious beings. And that is called love. Therefore, I said that meditation can give us the experience of the same thing called love total awareness and oneness. Um, Ishwar will be glad to answer any questions that you have. Yes, yes. Since we have this uh, true love and attachment, you said attachment causes separation. That experience of total awareness, oneness and love removes the experience of pain. Pain is an experience. It's not a thing. It's not a reality. When you live in the delusion of the mind, in separateness, you have the experience of pain. When you realize the reality of oneness, you remove the delusion of pain. 
It's like going to a dream and being hit by a knife and screaming with pain and waking up to find the knife was not real. It was a dream knife and having no pain. In oneness, we get out of the delusion of two. And therefore, there is no pain. We transcend pain. Pain exists only so long as the mind exists. So long as we are aware of the mind and function in mental awareness, we have pain. When we transcend mental awareness into spiritual awareness, we have no pain. The best way to increase the desire or seeking of love is to be more and more within yourself. That means meditate more. The more you are with yourself, the more will the seeking for love appear. You can try it out. And we do various things on the stage with masks on. We don't become what we are acting. So long as we are aware of what we are, we can pass through the worst act, perform all kinds of acts, get murdered on the, on the stage, and have all kinds of relationships on the stage, and yet be aware it's only an act we have to pass on. The experience of one who has developed awareness of himself when he acts with the covers on, with the masks on, is like the experience of an actor on the stage. He acts well, keeping the awareness that he is only acting. Yes? Fear. Fear. All fears are created by the unknown, by the lack of knowledge. There is no such thing as fear except in relation to the unknown. When we do not know a thing, we are afraid. When we know a thing, even if it is not good for us, we meet it differently, not with the experience of fear. Fear is always created by not knowing. Now what causes fear is the use of the mind. When we use the mind through the thinking machine, thinking leads to the contemplation of different possibilities. Different possibilities reveal to us that we do not know which one it is. These create doubt. Doubt creates lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge creates fear. It is a natural phenomenon that the more we think, the more afraid we are. You can see how fear grows out of the use of the analytical mental intellectual apparatus. The more we use the analysis of the mind, the more afraid we are. What happens when we transcend the mind? Instead of approaching anyone or any situation with these doubts, we approach with love, understanding he is the same aware thing which I am. The same awareness is operating. And love begets love, trust begets trust. You can try this experiment tomorrow. I set this experiment for a class some time back and returned after a month to find out the result. The experiment I set up was very simple. That even experimentally, from tomorrow, don't deal with people you meet on the basis of the mind. That means doubt, fear. From fear, there's a next step also called tension. All tensions arise from fear. So you don't meet with doubt, but meet with love and trust. And see what happens. They all reported back that the whole world has suddenly changed and they're all very fine people. They used to be pretty um, naughty people <coughs> before. Where have they gone? One person's consciousness brought about that change in consciousness. Actually, nobody changed. We are all basically the same conscious being. We are all basically loving creatures. We are made of love. We want to love. We need love. And all that we bother about inwardly in our real self is love. But when we use the cover of the mind, of reason, we all respond to the mind. If I speak to somebody with the mind, then I am doubtful. What is in the mind of the other guy? And what, what, the, what happens to that? Once I begin to suspect that I don't know, what is in the mind of the other guy, then I start speaking such words which create more doubt in the other mind. I say, are you quite sure? Are you sincere? Do you mean it? These are mental words. See, they all reflect the communication with the mind. Can I be absolutely sure? And you look and say such words, your eyes, your face, your words, speak the language of doubt. When you speak the language of doubt, the other guy says, this guy is not very certain. I can't be sure. He returns in the language of doubt. Doubt begets doubt. That leads to further misunderstanding, lack of knowledge of each other, and then fear, and then tension. 
when we just snap, replace it by the language of love and trust. So here this guy, he's the same awareness as I am, same soul, <coughs> same consciousness. Sure, he's made by the same creator. Here yeah, we are part of one. And we talk like that. He says, sure, if this guy can trust me so much, how can I betray him? So sure, he opens out his heart. And the whole communication process changes, and there is trust, love, and the, the whole world changes because everybody responds. Every human being responds to love. Yes. Did you say that everybody is just capable of being in a state of consciousness? Because it was, my question would be, it seems to me it requires quite a high level of intelligence and mind to even absorb what you're saying. Everybody is potentially capable of reaching the highest level of consciousness. I say potentially because we have ourselves created obstacles to that potential. What is needed is not intelligence, even to understand me, or to understand love, or to experience love. What is needed is the creation of detachment from mental activity. We are attached to mental activity. That's the only barrier. You can be very intelligent and grossly involved in mental attachments. You can get out. You can be absolutely dumb and not so attached, and you experience love. Love does not require intelligence or the lack of it. Love requires how free you can be from mental attachments. If you have less mental attachments, you are more easy to get away. If you have more mental attachments, you tie yourself down, you have to snap up more of these attachments. We have created so many attachments for ourselves through desire, through sensory functioning that it becomes difficult to snap them. And that is what causes difficulty, not the intelligence or lack of it. We have to tackle the problem of attachment, which means we have to find a means of detaching ourselves from mental attachments. And that creates a very interesting situation, which many of us don't notice. You cannot, by the mind, detach yourself. There is no mental process available for detachment. The mental process is available for attachment. The mind can attach. The mind has no capacity to detach. It's very strange, but that is how the mind functions. The mind attaches, then the mind attaches somewhere else, then somewhere else, and we get more and more tied up. How do we detach? We detach by a different process. Since we are at the mental level, the only way to detach ourselves is to attach to something more. You find a little child playing with a toy, it's so attached, the mom says, come on, have your supper, the child doesn't listen, it's dumb. It is attached to the toy. The mom can try as hard as she likes, the child doesn't let go of the toy. The mom brings a beautiful new toy, more attractive than the first, and places it before the child, the child throws away the first one, and picks up the second. An attachment to another thing can create attachment for another, for the earlier one. But you can't create detachment per se. The mental capacity of attachment is so strong that detachment is only by the process of elimination. Now, supposing we have all these worldly attractions that lead desire to it, which attach us, how do we withdraw? It is not possible to say, I am now going to detach from the world in order to go within. Nobody has done that. Nobody. People have tried in my country, India, to go to the top of the Himalayas and become yogis to practice the art of withdrawal there so that they may detach from the world. And they are sat up in the caves there and all their thoughts were downtown. <laughs> How can you get away from it? Supposing I decide to hide myself in a cave here and build up and I'm detaching. I'll hide myself in a dark cave. Nobody can see. I lock myself up in a sealed unit and I say I'm detached because I'm off, cut off. And all my thoughts are, how can I have that nice pizza selling outside? <laughs> you see, these, the thoughts keep us attached even if we physically try to detach ourselves. But there is one way of detaching ourselves that is to be more attached to something else. Thank you very much.